few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralysed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were sitting, were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. Thank you, Judy. Let's uh, pray and uh, we'll come before the Lord and uh, hear what his word has to say to us this morning. Let's pray. Abba Father, thank you for speaking to us in many, in various ways in the past, but in these last days for speaking to us by your Son. And thank you for the Bible, which is your word. Father, we pray that you would speak to us now and that by your Spirit you would cause us to hear and understand what you are saying to us and how we should live as your people. Please enable me, Father, to proclaim and to preach this word faithfully and to your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Question time. Well, friends, did you see the storm of protests and hear the howls of outrage in the media this week? Israel Falau preached a sermon on the bushfires and the drought, in case you didn't know. And he suggested that the drought and the fires could be a sign of God's judgment for same-sex marriage and abortion. 
God is speaking to you guys, he said. Australia, you need to repent and take these laws and turn it back to what's right. So what do you think? Is God judging our nation? There are plenty of people this week who are prepared to say that the answer is no. And this included our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, who declared on Monday that Falau's comments were appallingly insensitive and unhelpful. But why? I think it's because people today are in no mood to believe that God, if he exists at all, could be angry with us. It just doesn't fit the narrative. God can't be angry with us. And anyone who dares to say differently is being hateful and hurtful. That's the argument. God is a God of love. He loves us all. He endorses our behaviour. But what if the truth doesn't fit the narrative? What if God does allow bushfires and droughts to fall as warning signs on nations with whom he is righteously angry? Like Egypt in the days of Joseph? Or Jerusalem in the days of Acts, the Roman Empire in fact, when uh, Agabus warned the Christians to prepare for a drought and save the lives of many. What then? I think Israel Folau is right. Well, he may say things a little differently to me, but I agree. I agree when good is spoken of as evil and the truth is rejected as a lie, when justice is forsaken and the wicked rule over the wise, you can be sure that we are living in a time of testing, in a time of God's displeasure, in a time of God's wrath. I want to remind you that our God is a God of judgment and he won't let us get away with it. To do so would be to deny reality, the reality of the character of God who is holy so that his justice and his love both must be reconciled, which brings us to the cross. In the days of Isaiah, in the last days of the northern kingdom, around 700 BC, Isaiah showed great courage in speaking out against the wickedness of his own fellow citizens. And he said these words here, Woe to those who call good evil and evil good, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You get the point? Nothing much has changed in the world, has it? So yes, we do have a problem when it comes to God's judgement, but the problem is us. We are the problem. Our rebellion and our rejection of God's way and God's word. Now today's passage is not about the bushfire and the droughts, I know that, but it is about the sinfulness of humanity, which is a closely related subject. So enter the Pharisees and the teachers of the law in Mark chapter 2 and you'll see that their thinking and behaviour is consistently negative against Jesus. In fact, no matter what Jesus says, they will always find reason to criticise him. Sound familiar? So Jesus said, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. And they say, what an appallingly insensitive and unhelpful comment. For example, verse 7. Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Or in verse 16. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Or verse 18. How is it? that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not. Bad Jesus. The problem is these people have an inverted view of reality, an upside down view of the world. They put darkness for light and light for darkness. They call good evil and evil good and they're convinced that they're right and we're wrong. Jesus is the one who needs to repent, not us. Jesus is the problem, not us. It could never be us. But what if it is us? What if we're the problem? Take the story of Jesus and the paralysed man. My first point for today, I've called it questions about authority. Questions about authority. It's a well-known story, but watch what happens by the end of it. Verse 1, as Judy just read to us a moment ago, 
Verse 1, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he'd come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Notice, he preached the word. He came back home to Capernaum and he preached the word. Perhaps he preached the parable of the sower. Perhaps he taught them about the four types of soil and gave them a message about faith. Maybe he told them about the servant of the Lord and explained how the servant would open the eyes of the blind and set the captives free. We don't know what part of God's word Jesus preached, but whatever he preached, we know that he preached the word. And as he was preaching, there was a commotion in the crowd, a man being carried on a stretcher by four faithful friends. So let's find out what they're up to. Hey guys, what are you doing? Well, can't you see? Our friend is paralysed. Can't move. There's only one person who can help him and that's Jesus. If only he could see Jesus, we know he could be healed. Jesus can do it, we know he can. Jesus has the power to do the miracles of God. And so we brought him all the way to Capernaum on this stretcher, the four of us. We carried him here. But when we got here, the crowd was so great, it's impossible. What are we going to do? That's a great story. And we love this part, don't we, in verse 4. Since they couldn't get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralysed man was lying on. I mean, can you imagine what it must have been like on the inside of the house? The sound of scratching and digging, first of all, on the roof over your head, and then the removal of tiles and wood and clay, a shower of dust perhaps, and then a ray of sunshine. Goodness knows what the owner of the house was thinking. And then down through that hole comes the paralysed man, down, down, down to the feet of Jesus. And we're told in verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, to the man on the mat, son, Your sins are forgiven. It is an extraordinary thing to say, isn't it? Son, your sins are forgiven. In the Old Testament, only a prophet of God would dare to say something like this. Nathan spoke similarly to David, but he spoke on behalf of the Lord. Whereas Jesus seems to speak with an even greater authority For he forgives the man's sins himself. He doesn't say the Lord has forgiven your sins. He says your sins are forgiven as if he himself has forgiven the man's sins. And he says it like he means it because he does mean it. Son, your sins are forgiven. And at that moment, the man who was paralysed received from Jesus something far better than a mere physical healing. He received a whole new relationship with God. A new beginning, a new future. It is the best gift you could ever hope to receive. Jesus has given this man a royal pardon. It is the gift of the king's own forgiveness that this man has received and that is special. Son, your sins are forgiven. But is everyone happy? No. In verse 6, you'll notice there's a definite cooling in the room among some of the more educated class of people. They're called the scribes or the teachers of the law. Verse 6, now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Please understand their logic at this point is faultless. They're absolutely right to ask the question, but they're absolutely wrong to close their hearts and minds against Jesus. By the way, the mention of blasphemy, did you pick that up in verse 7, tells you that these people are already starting to think of killing Jesus because that was the penalty for blasphemy. They're just one step away from that conclusion. Death by stoning. So they're prepared to kill Jesus because of what he's talking about in terms of forgiveness. That's an upside down view of reality, isn't it? 
So for the first time we begin to get a sense of what is going on in these people's hearts. They see themselves as the moral gatekeepers of society. Whereas this fellow, Jesus, mark the language, this fellow, well, he's just a dangerous upstart and we need to pull him into line. But Jesus knew their hearts and in verse 8 he responds to their narrow-minded prejudice by asking them some questions of his own. It is question time in Galilee today. Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins? He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Get up, take your mat and go home. The man got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we've never seen anything like this. So the authority of Jesus was clearly displayed that day, wasn't it? And the hopes and dreams of that once paralysed man and his four friends were more than satisfied. Sins forgiven, health restored, carried his mat back home. It was a day to remember and rejoice in Capernaum. And you might think this would be the end of the matter. However, in calling himself the Son of Man in verse 10, did you notice Jesus is throwing out another challenge to the teachers of the law because the Son of Man is the Messiah figure in Daniel chapter 7. And the teachers of the law would have known what Jesus was talking about, but they would never have accepted that this passage was pointing to him. If they ever did accept it, then that would turn their world upside down and then Jesus would begin to make a whole lot more sense. Let me remind you of what Daniel says about Jesus in his prophecy from Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. It's on the screen. He says... In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All peoples, nations and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. You can't escape God's judgment. You can't deny my authority to rule over you. I am the Son of Man. And yet I've come to lay down my life for you. You see, God's word still speaks to us today. Even though many people remain opposed to the person and work of Jesus Christ, God's word today reminds us that that dream of human autonomy is a lie and it will not stand. Listen up Australia, God is speaking to you guys. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus Christ is Lord. This means bringing your life under the authority of God's word. This means confessing your sins to Jesus and being truly sorry and turning back to God. This means rejoicing in the good news of the new life that God has given you, that royal pardon that is issued to all who turn to him in faith. And this means sharing your hope with others around you, in your family and amongst your friends and in our community. And of course this means standing firm and staying faithful in the face of arrogant and unbelieving people. Now it's time to move on to my second point for today. I've called it questions about integrity. In verses 13 to 17 we have another well-known passage which I'm sure you'll recognise. So here we go, verse 13. Once again Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. 
We saw the same thing happen to Simon and Andrew and James and John last week, didn't we? The fishermen, the four fishermen. Well, now it's Levi's turn. But Levi is different because Levi, also known as Matthew, is a tax collector, which, to put it bluntly, means he is not the best candidate for a ministry uh, disciple. Not the first choice in the eyes of most. Levi's inclusion in Jesus' team raises big questions about Jesus' integrity as a leader. How can he choose a man of Levi's reputation to be in his team and still claim to be a man of God? And that's what people are wondering. The teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, were more than just perplexed. They were scandalised by Jesus' unorthodox choice of Levi. In fact, tax collectors like Levi were so hated they had almost no friends except among their own kind. But in Rome, they found, and here it is up here, they found an inscription on a tax collector's gravestone from around the time of Jesus and it tells us a lot because it says, here lies an honest tax collector, Titus Flavius Sabinus. It's so rare to find an honest tax collector that it's worth putting on a man's tombstone. So there was one, at least, honest tax collector. Now, Levi was a tax collector, a despised servant of the Roman government, rich and wealthy, but an absolute outcast in his society. And yet for that very reason, it seems to me, that's why Levi catches Jesus' eye. He is the social outcast who will most appreciate the miracle of God's grace in his life. That Jesus should say, follow me, to one like Levi. And Levi got up and followed him. And another soul is one. To the kingdom. But the teachers of the law are watching. And their behaviour at this point reminds me of the impeachment process going on in the United States. This partisan sort of thing that happens between the Democrats and the Republicans. Or the trial of Cardinal Pell here in Australia. Guilt is presumed ahead of the, the, the verdict. Guilt is presumed and then they go looking for evidence. That's what's happening here. Why else do they join the evangelistic dinner at Levi's house if not to look for proof of Jesus' guilt? Verse 16. When the teachers of the law who are Pharisees saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Perhaps we can impeach him on this. Do you see what's happening? They're asking his disciples. They're going behind Jesus' back to try to upset the disciples and cast doubts about Jesus' integrity. Why does your master hang out with these bad people? And that's how the Pharisees are thinking. Why do you follow Jesus? Look at how this fellow defiles himself among tax collectors and sinners. It's a disgrace, that's what it is. But Jesus is ready with his own defence. In verse 17, he hears what these troublemakers are saying and he steps in to rebuke them. It is not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I don't think it would have been an answer that satisfied them. But it is a great reminder for us today, is it not? But we need to remember Jesus' primary mission in this world, which is to reach out and to save people who need to be saved. I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners. If Jesus was here with us today, he would tell us to get out there and start connecting. And I encourage you and I thank you for that ministry that we are undertaking. But isn't that what Jesus would urge us to do? To use every opportunity we have to bring new people into a saving knowledge of Christ and not to worry about what they say or don't say. No, Jesus would say, if you love me, get out there and start connecting because when people meet Jesus, they meet God and that's what really matters. It's not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick. 
I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So we have work to do. Jesus' integrity is not compromised by his love for the lost. On the contrary, it is enhanced. And we love him for it because it is an essential part of what makes Jesus who he is. He is our Lord. He is our Messiah. He is our servant king. And we praise him with all our hearts. To enter the kingdom of God means to leave behind the kingdom of the world. That choice has to be made. It happens when you choose to follow Jesus and you will either love him or hate him. You will either accept him or reject him. But part of that process involves finding out who Jesus is and asking the questions about his authority, his integrity, his consistency. These are reasonable questions and they need to be asked. So my third point for today is concerning questions about consistency. It may sound like a trivial issue, but actually it aims deeper than that because it goes to the heart of Jesus' identity as the Messiah and it teaches us also how we are to live in the light of the coming of Jesus as our king. So verse 18, now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting but yours are not? Is this another example of Jesus' bad leadership? Is this another impeachable offence? His disciples have failed to keep the fast. And what does that tell you about Jesus? Bad Jesus. It seems in those days the Jews made a virtue out of being miserable. The Pharisees believed that mourning over your sins and feeling guilty would help you to stay holy. So they fasted twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, on top of any other official fast like the Day of Atonement. They were fasting fanatics and they were religious about it. They were devoted to mourning over their sins. And you can see there's, there's, a, there's an element of wisdom to that, isn't it? But you take it to extremes and it becomes the problem. Seems to me that the hungrier they were, the happier they were. But is that the life that God is calling us to live? So when Jesus' disciples are caught out eating food, the fun police are onto it immediately. Ah, these guys are eating on a Tuesday. How dare you dishonour God with your feasting? You should be fasting. Put that food in the bin. Such ungodliness. Well, I never. How can Jesus explain this one? He has to answer carefully. So he says to them, it's another question, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. See, in those days, one of the exceptions to the fasting rules was if you're getting married, well, you were allowed to not keep the fast. Weddings qualified as one of the exceptions to the rule. So you could eat and have fun and celebrate if you're getting married. And you could also eat and have fun and celebrate on the day that God restores the kingdom to Israel. But only then. As the bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you, O Israel. These are words from Isaiah chapter 62 verse 5. You see, in the Old Testament there is this hope that God will return one day to marry his people, to be the bridegroom for Israel and there will be the return of the king and that is the idea that Israel and the Pharisees have of this wedding day, which we as Christians take over, don't we, as the wedding of the Lamb, where we're looking forward to being united to Christ forever. It's biblical, it's also Jewish, except that Jesus fulfills it as we see today. But that hope is there in the Old Testament. 
that God is going to be Israel's bridegroom. So what is Jesus saying in our passage today? Isn't he saying, guys, hello, I'm here now. I'm the bridegroom. It's time to celebrate. It's time for joy and happiness to break out. Joy and happiness in the Lord ought to be our daily experience as Christians. Is it yours? Thankfulness to God ought to be our daily experience as Christians. It should be. Grace and peace and love ought to be our daily experience as Christians. It can be. Because we belong to Christ. And yes, we will grieve over our sins and we will confess that we are unworthy creatures before our holy God, but we will not go about weeping and mourning every day like the Pharisees did because the joy of the kingdom belongs to us because we've received the king's pardon and Jesus is our bridegroom. How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them and on that day they will fast. Clearly Jesus is hinting here about a future coming event, isn't he? He's hinting about the crucifixion that he will lay down his life even for his enemies, that we might become friends with God. And so as Christians we do mourn on Easter Friday but then with the resurrection we rejoice That is our pattern and that is our experience. The joy of Christ conquers all our tears. So here's the things, my friends, today. Unless you're looking for a saviour who saves sinners, you won't understand what Jesus is on about. You need to understand the wrath of God in order to appreciate the love of Christ. And this is where verses 21 and 22 come in. Kingdom answers, the shock of the new. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. You see, now that Christ has come, life for God's people will be different It will be so different that you can't simply stitch the two together. You can't patch the Old Testament way of life onto the New Testament way of life. You can't patch Jesus into the law and the temple system. The new must be allowed to supersede the old. And this is still true for us today, isn't it? I mean, it was true for the teachers of the law and the Pharisees who had to grapple with this question of Jesus' identity. It's true for us as non-Christians who are coming to know Christ as well from whatever background you may come from. For now that Christ has come to you, your life needs to change. The new must be allowed to supersede the old. Jesus is not just some patch that you can patch onto your old life. You can't just patch a Sunday and leave Monday to Saturday how it was. Jesus has to go into every aspect and part of your life. Jesus is not just some new blend of Shiraz that you can pour into your old wineskins. You must learn to enter the joy of salvation into that full relationship with Christ for the old has gone and the new has come. So to finish, I want to bring these truths home to ourselves today. When you really make that change to follow Jesus, you must understand that you will put yourself out of step with the world. When you follow Jesus, you will put yourself out of step with the world. And people will challenge you and they will try to discourage you and they'll accuse you of doing wrong and they'll say to you that your warnings about sin are appallingly insensitive and unhelpful. And they'll ask you to stop speaking and they'll ask you to go away. Just like they did to Israel for Lau. Well, get used to it. To enter the kingdom of God means to leave behind the kingdom of the world. We must put off the old and put on the new. 
That's the kingdom answer that Jesus keeps on giving, isn't it? He himself is that dividing line in history between BC and AD and he will keep on being so in the life of each and every one of us as we let go of our old lives and receive that new life in Christ. So today we must be prepared to keep on doing what is right, not what is easy. As Christians we must respond to every challenge we face with love and with grace and with courage and with clarity. We must look people in the eye and speak the truth in love even if they threaten us or intimidate us or call us to be quiet. We ourselves have become the shock of the new for Christ is with us. We ourselves, the misfits, the outcasts and the strangers of this world have been surprised by grace have received that royal pardon, have accepted the gift of the king's forgiveness. And so we say with Isaiah all those years ago, woe to those who call good evil and evil good, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And people will always go on asking all sorts of questions about Jesus, just as in our passage today. But the question we ask is, are you following him? Now is the time for God's people to stand up for what we believe in, knowing that our God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. O Lord our God, we bend our knee before your throne this day. For those of us who are lost, we pray that we would be found by you today. That like Levi, you would come into our lives and say, follow me, and that in that moment we would leave all behind and come. And for those of us, Lord, who are perhaps like the Pharisees, so caught up in the mourning and the grief, lacking the joy of our salvation, Help us to catch that fresh view of Jesus with his disciples, knowing the love and grace of our King, who is both holy and forgiving, full of glory, truth and grace. You alone have known the Father and beheld his face. And yet in you we meet his fullness through the open heaven above. In your cross we see his suffering and we know the Father's love. Father, we thank you for this word to us today. Please encourage and inspire us to follow and to trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.